This is College Matters from The Chronicle. I'm Jack Stripling. I saw students pounding desks, putting their heads down on tables, in some cases tearing up or crying, having to run out of the room just because they couldn't get federal aid offer in the time frame that they had expected it. This academic year, lots of students are headed to college without any clue of how they'll pay for it. They're in kind of a limbo because of something known as FAFSA, or the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. And bear with me because this is about paperwork. FAFSA is a federal form that prospective college students fill out every year to determine how much money they can get from the government for tuition and fees. Filling out this form has been an annoying rite of passage for students, many of whom can't decide whether college is even an option until this pesky task is complete. The U.S. Department of Education recently sought to simplify it, but things did not go as planned. The rollout of the form in December 2023 was a train wreck. Technical glitches made the form impossible for some students to complete, and some just gave up trying to fill it out. In a cruel irony, many of the students who've experienced the worst problems in this slow-moving crisis are the same people who need the most help accessing college. Today on the show, my colleague Eric Hoover breaks down who FAFSA is failing and how families are making the calculation of whether college is worth it. Eric, great to have you here on College Matters from The Chronicle. Thank you, Jack. Great to be with you. So, Eric, break this down for me. Tell me in a real practical way how FAFSA ends up getting me money if I'm going to college. Right. Well, uh, colleges need a measure of your family's ability to pay for college, right? And so there is a federal methodology that is built into the FAFSA. So a college wants to know, do you qualify for federal aid? And if so, how much federal aid will you get? Well, once you complete the FAFSA, you will know that as an applicant and the college will know that. And so it is the bedrock for the entire financial aid system, whether you intend to enroll at a community college or a four-year institution, you need to complete the FAFSA to get any federal aid. So it is a form that everyone and every financial aid office needs to work with to figure out how to best allot scarce resources and to figure out what is a fair amount of money to give this applicant versus this applicant over here. So Eric, there's a lot of different types of financial aid, and I want to make sure that I understand how FAFSA fits into the way that it's doled out to students. In one bucket, we have institutional aid, which includes scholarships provided by the colleges themselves. They're essentially dipping into their own bank accounts to help their students. Those colleges often use the FAFSA to help determine how much money the scholarship will be worth. Now, in another bucket, we have federal money, like Pell Grants, which students have to fill the FAFSA out in order to receive. And the colleges are kind of the middleman for that money, right? I mean, typically, the college applies that federal money toward a student's tuition and fees, and anything left over can go directly to the student. So (laughs) I'm sure there are probably exceptions to what I've described here, but do I generally have this right? Yes, that's exactly right. So what the hell happened? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I I think for all the years that FAFSA simplification, that is the effort to overhaul and simplify the FAFSA, for all the years that went into it, the education department just ran out of time. It was a massive overhaul. The FAFSA is based on antiquated technology systems, and they're required to meet a deadline to get the FAFSA available by this past January 1st. They barely made that deadline but they did not deliver a fully functioning FAFSA. Early on, it was just a lot of glitches. I talked to so many families who got almost all the way through the FAFSA, and then the submit button just disappeared. Many folks were just stuck kind of in limbo. It wasn't just glitches or frozen buttons. It was also like the numbers that the system relies on. More recently, colleges receiving process FAFSAs started to notice something funny. The data they could tell very quickly and easily in many cases was wrong. And that is, they couldn't trust the calculations that the FAFSA system was spitting out and sending to their institutions. And so that was a major concern that affected colleges and students alike. If you and I both apply to College X and College X can see that there's problems with the data, they might worry 
that they're about to award one of us more aid than we actually are entitled to based on the FAFSA methodology. But the other one might be awarded less. And so they have to be accurate, right? You know, we're just a mess and they were coming through and colleges weren't sure what to make of that. And so that led to further delays to make sure that all of the inaccurate data had been fixed and ironed out within the ed department and then sent back to colleges. So this is not ticket master freezes and we don't get Taylor Swift tickets. This is every entity that FAFSA touches is now impacted by this. How much money you get, whether the offer's right, college is skeptical about whether the numbers are correct, delays in getting you these answers, all of these things. It sounds like a nightmare. This just brings an entire industry, the industry of higher education, so colleges and universities, but also state systems, state aid systems, scholarship entities. There are so many small and large private scholarships that are going to want to see a completed FAFSA. That is a process FAFSA to award aid to students. So this entire industry and everything that depends on it was just basically brought to its knees and brought to a halt. Have you been able to wrap your arms around the size of the fiasco? Is there anything out there that you're looking at and monitoring completion rates, things like that of the form that tell us anything? It's a jarring graph to look at. If you look at federal data, that's been released regularly throughout the year and tracked by the National College Attainment Network, I think every Friday. When you look at the completion rate, about 10% fewer graduating high school seniors completed the FAFSA this year. You know, And I think close to 14 million FAFSAs have been filed overall. That's a huge drop. And I think that is the chart that people keep looking at or forcing themselves to look at. And I think as we get on through the year, the less likely it is that we'll see that number improve. You think of students who graduated in May or June of 2024, once it gets deep into the summer and fall, like they're probably just not going to fill out that federal aid form. What people don't know is, what does that look like? What does that translate into? How many of those 10% or so would have otherwise gone to college? People are going to be trying to figure out the impact of that decline on higher ed in general, and certainly on particular colleges for months and years to come. You've reported on kind of a cruel irony that some of the students who had the most trouble are the students who also have life circumstances that even in the best of circumstances would make it hard to go to college. Talk to me a little bit about why that particular group of students has had trouble. Well, you know, I think it's fair to say that no subgroup of applicants was hit harder than U.S.-born students who have parents who aren't citizens, so undocumented parents. We're talking generally here about a subgroup of students who already face plenty of challenges when it comes to figuring out how to apply to college and how to apply for financial aid and figuring out how they're going to afford it. Um, These are students who have parents who uh, don't have a social security number, and these students are fully entitled to federal aid. But it is harder for them now, especially, to get that aid that that is their right. Eric, can you tell me why students who have undocumented parents have been affected so severely by this crisis? Part of FAFSA simplification was intended to enable those families to benefit from the new and improved system. Part of that new and improved system for everyone was meant to be that you could rather easily link your FAFSA application to the IRS database and directly port in your tax information. Doing that cuts down on errors. That's something that was hailed as one of the major changes that would benefit all families. Hey, if you don't have to enter your own tax information manually anymore or go through this kind of clunky transfer process that existed previously, oh my gosh, you can pre-populate part of your form. Won't that be easier for everyone? Well, it probably was easier for many families, but that part of the process never worked for parents who are undocumented. And so there was just a broken bridge in between the FAFSA and the Internal Revenue Service database and also the Department of Homeland Security database. And this is the broken bridge that has hung up so many mixed status families, undocumented parents haven't been able to use that 
new and improved, smoother transfer of data process. And so they had to go through a workaround that involved them getting on the telephone to try to confirm their identity through other means. They had to verify their identity to be able to complete their portion of the FAFSA. And until they did, the FAFSA that their son or daughter had completed themselves could not be uh, moved forward, could not be processed by the government, and could not result in a financial aid offer for colleges. So what was once an arduous and painstaking process for students whose parents were undocumented became even more so or even impossible? I don't know that the previous process was that arduous. It was just previously undocumented parents were required to go through this kind of old school analog process, print something out, sign it, put it in an envelope, put a stamp on it, and mail it off to a processing facility where many counselors will tell you it would sit for a while, maybe a long while, before it was processed, allowing the kiddos FAFSA to move forward. So that was a time-consuming process on the back end. It was relatively easy for parents to do, but the thought was, let's bring everyone, all families, including undocumented parents who don't have a social security number, into the 21st century and create a process that will enable all of them, regardless of their citizenship status, to seamlessly, supposedly, and painlessly bring in their tax information online. It's just that that part of the process did not work at all or work very well for undocumented parents who were being asked for the first time to verify their identity while interfacing with the FAFSA on their computer. And so this year, all of those students, when it came time to have their parents try to fill out their portion of the FAFSA, in so many cases, watch their mothers and fathers try but fail to get through this form. And it wasn't their fault. It was the FAFSA's fault. And hitting roadblock after roadblock, they weren't able to complete it. And so I've talked to students about uh, the impact of that. Many students with undocumented parents already feel like they're not fully welcome in this country. They feel anxious about their place in this country. And oh gosh, When my mother and father, who are so proud of me, tried to do this one thing to get through the form and they could not, some of them told me that their parents cried. Some of them told me that their parents felt like they had failed their kiddo just because they couldn't get through this form. So I think there is an emotional impact of that. I mean, uh, you know, how warm and welcome would you feel about your government as a U.S. born student knowing that your parents might have tried for weeks or months repeatedly to get through the FAFSA and it's just not working for them. That's a kind of a chilling message that young people have been sent. But this goes beyond undocumented families, right? Who else is being affected? Well, I mentioned a student who I've been talking with in recent days, happens to be a student who has experienced homelessness most of her life. She's already enrolled in college. She's got straight A's, she's doing great. But she filed the FAFSA in early January, a few days after it became available, and she still doesn't have a financial aid offer. She already knows where she's going to college for her second year, but she needs that money. She needs that aid disbursement. She needs that Pell Grant. And she's looking at a looming deadline to make her next payment so that she can stay enrolled in college. And she still doesn't have that federal aid that's come through. Ah, and another headache for her is that she has a private scholarship that she was supposed to receive for four or five years. But in order to renew it, she has to show that scholarship agency, a private scholarship agency, her financial aid offer, which she doesn't have. And she knows that the deadline for showing that financial aid offer to the scholarship organization has passed at the end of July. So she's got her fingers crossed that she'll still somehow end up with that scholarship money that she needs in addition to her federal aid. But she just doesn't know that. And it was a reminder that, yes, the FAFSA is a form, right? It's a it's a lengthy government document. But when you spend time around students trying to get through it, thinking about the big step they're about to take in their lives, in most cases, 
the students in this low-income high school I visited are about to become the first in their families to ever enroll in college. They just want to get on with their lives. They want to get on with their senior year, and they want to talk about prom, and they just want to be done with the whole college admissions process. They want to be able to tell their friends, I'm going to this college. They want to buy a sweatshirt or a hat from the college that they've chosen, and then just being stuck in limbo. It just felt especially cruel. And again, for them, this wasn't just a headache or a temporary setback. It felt like even a question of like who I am and who I'm trying to be in this world was called into question. 17-year-olds and 18-year-olds, we know, right, can get kind of emotional about pretty much anything on a dime. But yeah, sure. I saw students pounding desks, putting their heads down on tables, I and mean, in some cases, uh, tearing up or crying, having to run out of the room just because they couldn't get a federal aid offer in the time frame that they had expected it. And so one young woman said to me, I feel like the FAFSA has blown a hole in my life. And another said, this has made me question whether college is really for me. And I wouldn't discount how powerful a statement that is, even if many of them ended up getting through it in the end. Stick around. We'll be back in a minute. If you're enjoying the show, do us a favor and subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. Also, leave a review or invite a friend to listen. You can find our show notes and sign up for a newsletter at chronicle.com slash college matters. And thanks for listening. Eric, for a lot of students, college is only possible with financial aid. For others, it's nice to have, but not essential. Can you talk about how the FAFSA crisis has affected students differently depending on their financial circumstances? For many lucky students, they will be able to put this in the rearview mirror. But for students who are especially vulnerable, I've interviewed so many students throughout 2024 who've talked to me about how $500 or $100 or $50 is a huge amount of money in their lives. And so when you think about students who don't have much money, who are dealing with this stress and uncertainty, I think in some cases it will take a toll and affect them as college students. And what several students who are still waiting for an aid offer this year have told me is they're worried about what happens in the next cycle. There's great uncertainty looming over the FAFSA as we head into the next financial aid cycle later this year. Will the FAFSA be totally fixed? Will there be some of the same problems further delaying students? Will there be new uh, glitches and gremlins um, bedeviling the system? So I think for students who are already enrolled, can this mess with their momentum? I think that's a concern. And yeah, it'll work out for many students, but for some students, it just won't, right? They won't stay in college. Some have decided to forego college at least for this fall semester because of the fact that in some cases they're still stuck and can't get financial aid. And then, you know, the big question is what is the downstream effect? Students who have just heard about this, right? Maybe they watched their older sibling or heard about a friend who hit all these snags. How does this complicate their understanding of like how easy it's going to be for me, particularly if they're a low income first in their family to attend college student? I don't know that it's going to be so rosy for students who are already perhaps ambivalent about this whole college thing. And a few hundred dollars is the difference between I'm going to college and I'm not. Right. I mean, the, the fact is for many Americans attending college, a few hundred dollars either way could be the difference between pass and go and continuing on through college or dropping out, stopping out. So maybe that's a flat tire. Maybe that's your child's doctor bill that you weren't expecting that week. I mean, I just talked to a student who told me that as she's waiting for federal aid that she doesn't have, she's been looking at the cost of toothpaste and making decisions about which toothpaste to choose based on maybe 25 cent difference, right? For some families, that's not something they need to think about. But some students are making constant decisions, even for small dollars here and there, so that they can stay afloat and continue on to their degree. So are there any students who are getting through this FAFSA thing without any trouble? 
Yeah. I mean, look, it is a fact that many students had little or no problem filling out the FAFSA in 2024, especially after the first rough couple of weeks where glitches were affecting basically everyone or seemingly hindering people at random. A wise high school counselor on the West Coast has observed that, you know, in his experience, the FAFSA works well for those families it works for. And I've talked to plenty of students and parents who had no trouble at all. Even some students who had a particular snag along the way, including some students who throughout the summer are still waiting for aid offers, they've told me, particularly if they filled out the FAFSA previously, if they're already in college, they've told me they think the new form is easier, simpler, more user-friendly. Even some students who hit a brick wall through no fault of their own while trying to get through the FAFSA have told me that they think it's better than the previous model. The trick is, you know, it's a hard thing to talk about. Hey, all these people over here had a swell time and was smooth sailing and were able to do the FAFSA in 10 or 15 minutes. When we live in a country where so many people weren't able to get through it after months and months. It's just, it's compelling to hear you frame it this way that people's dreams and futures are really hanging in the balance here because of what seems a technical problem. Um, it's heartbreaking. And I wonder that heartbreak is shared by the students and their families for sure. But who are the people who are on the front lines trying to help these students rectify the situation and what has happened to their lives as a result of this? Yeah. Well, I mean, first and foremost, uh, high school counselors, college advisors, the many folks from community-based organizations that work closely with college applicants, particularly low-income and first-generation college applicants, they've just been put through the ringer, right? So we're talking about, honestly, in my experience, writing for many years about college access and college admissions, the adults whose job it is to help students, particularly students who need a lot of help, get through the admissions process and the federal aid process are already people who are inclined to work eight days a week, to work well into the evening, to get on the phone with a student or parent late at night, to meet families at Starbucks um, if they don't have internet at home and help them complete an aid form or a college application, you name it. That's what these folks do in a normal year. And in this year, well, they just haven't really been sleeping. So many counselors I'm in touch with were, as one told me, she was just feeling like she was waking up in agony every day. And why was that? Well, she, like many counselors, sees herself as an evangelist, she just said, for higher education, often dealing with families who are skeptical, or they think we'll never be able to afford it, or my son or daughter should just graduate from high school and start working. And so many counselors are trying to communicate that families should at least consider higher education, consider their options. And they've been people who preach the idea that it's going to be okay. You can afford at least some colleges. Your son or daughter should at least consider it seriously. And then so many members of those communities this year came to counselors asking, you said it was going to be okay. What happened? Why can't we get through this form? And that has been a really tough situation to put counselors in. I mean, how do you sit down and counsel a low-income family about making sense of their aid offers if they don't have any on the table to look at? That has worn out many people who have plenty of other reasons to be worn out as they help students through this process in a normal year. You know, the, the one group we haven't really talked about here is the colleges themselves, Presumably, they want to be able to give aid offers to these students. They want to be able to recruit these students. A lot of colleges are super gung-ho about the very students you're describing. What's this experience been like for them? If you are an admissions or enrollment official, and particularly if you work in a financial aid office, you know the financial aid profession has been basically hung out to dry by the FAFSA debacle. They're not able to work nearly as efficiently as they normally would. Students are waiting, families are waiting for aid offers, and it's your office's job and responsibility to create those aid offers and get them out in a timely fashion. And to the extent that that has just not been a possibility in so many instances this year, that is agonizing, right? And so 
the impact on some colleges will be minimal. On other institutions, it'll be great. I'm doing some reporting right now in a college that is coming up about 20% short of its targeted enrollment for this year's freshman class. Not all, but many of the students who didn't come are from low-income, if not extremely low-income families. And so coming in with a, a freshman class that's about 20% smaller than what you had anticipated has implications not just for the college's finances, but also for like the culture that they're trying to create. That institution's freshman class will be less diverse socioeconomically as well as in terms of race and ethnicity than they probably would have ended up with. And so figuring out how to recover from that and figuring out what the long-term implications of that are going to be, you know, what the experience of being a student on that campus at least for some folks, might be different than it would have been otherwise. And so that's a major headache, right? Uh, many colleges have said that they've had layoffs and furloughs as a direct result, at least in part, of a downturn in the number of students who have sent deposits, many of whom might have come otherwise if not for the FAFSA crisis. It can mean people's jobs. Right. And there's no certainty that the next round of the FAFSA will be smooth sailing. So this could all happen again. I think there's great concern in many enrollment offices and certainly in financial aid offices that the sequel is uh, is looming. And, uh, you know, sometimes sequels are great. Sometimes they're worse than the original, but right. the sequel to the FAFSA <laughs> crisis is, I think, what people are just bracing for. If it's not as bad this time around as it was the first time around, it can still be pretty bad. Yeah. You know, you and I have both been writing about higher education for a long time, and one of the recurring stories that we cover is about public confidence in college. And that can seem like kind of a esoteric thing to care about, whether people think college is good. I wonder what you think this crisis has done to people's confidence in higher education, and whether that has any long-term effects that we should care about. I think the FAFSA crisis could have a long-term impact on how at least some Americans see higher education. Most people don't understand the ins and outs of the FAFSA. They just know it's not working. They just know it took forever to get an aid offer, or they just know that they still don't have an aid offer months after filling out the darn form. For some families, it's been more. It's been more than frustrating. It's been more than annoying. It's been frightening, and it's been harrowing. And people talk to their friends, to their family members. I've talked to folks from a high school in San Diego who said months into the FAFSA crisis, they were hearing from families who said that, oh, we've heard that students who are born in the US but who have undocumented parents can no longer get federal aid. Well, we know that that's not true. Students who are born in the US are entitled to federal aid regardless of their parents' immigration status. But word gets around that the system isn't working. It's not hard to imagine why some families in that community apparently were hearing, oh, something has changed this year and those students aren't able to get federal aid. And you can't really blame them for making that connection because some students weren't able to get federal aid. And I think until families and high school counselors see that things are working better, then this is... This is just going to be a crisis for at least another year to come, unfortunately. So I think the story of the FAFSA saga is partly a story about the kind of society we want to live in, right? Don't we want to live in a society where people from all backgrounds, including low-income backgrounds, including people who have been marginalized and underrepresented in this country forever, shouldn't people who fit those descriptions in some way have the broadest set of opportunities and chances to move forward in life, whatever that looks like, and to get to and get through higher ed? And if you answer yes, I would say, well, then this story is kind of at the moment a sad story because those opportunities have been constrained and so many students have been limited and had their choices narrowed as they're trying to make their way on to do things that we want young people to do, right? Like get to college and become our doctors and nurses and school teachers. Um, and we want those people, I hope, to be representative of this country. And this year, the FAFSA just made kind of the launching point for many people who want to seek opportunities a little bit more difficult, if not a lot more so. Eric Hoover, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Jack. 
If you want to read Eric Hoover's coverage of the FAFSA crisis and all things about students and admissions, check out Chronicle.com. College Matters from the Chronicle is a production of the Chronicle of Higher Education, the nation's leading independent newsroom covering colleges. If you like the show, please leave us a review or invite a friend to listen. And remember to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts so that you never miss an episode. You can find an archive of every episode, all of our show notes, and much more at chronicle.com slash college matters. If you like, drop us a note at collegematters at chronicle.com. We are produced by Rococo Punch. Our original podcast artwork is by Catrell Thomas. Special thanks to our colleagues Brock Reed, Laura Krantz, Sarah Brown, Claire Wallace, Ron Coddington, Josh Hatch, Fernanda Zamudio Suarez, and all of the people at the Chronicle who make this show possible. I'm Jack Stripling. Thanks for listening.